Hey everyone, uh, my name is Valerie. I work with the Okanagan Similkameen Stewardship Society, or OSS. Um, welcome to part two of our presentations on snakes. Uh, before I get started, I'm just going to take a minute to let everyone know uh, who we are. Uh, so OSS is a local nonprofit charity that works in the Okanagan and Similkameen Valleys. Uh, we work with private landowners and communities in our area to help go to help them conserve and care for local wildlife habitats. Part of this mission is community workshops and presentations just like this one. Uh, you can see uh, some photos of our community events just on the left here. Uh, much of our work though centers around our wildlife habitat steward program. This is the program that allows us to partner with local landowners to help, to help them care for the habitats on their properties. Uh, within the program, we are able to assist them with a variety of projects. Um, and you can see a few of our wildlife habitat stewards just on the right. So if you like the sound of what we do and you want to get involved, please visit our website just right there, uh, www.osstewardship.ca. Um, and you can also visit us on Facebook and Instagram. But uh, back to the snake presentation. So this is part two of our series on snakes. Part one, which is just about snakes in general, can be found on our website, which I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. This video is going to focus more specifically on the snakes of the Okanagan and Smilkmeen and how to be snake smart and safely encounter snakes at home uh, and at work. So in order to be safe and snake smart in an area where you may encounter a venomous snake, you need to be able to be familiar with the snakes in the area, be able to identify them, um, as well as know where or why you might encounter a snake at any given time. Snakes are present in all habitats, um, aside from alpine habitats. And this is because like any animal, they need to move around the landscape in order to meet their different needs. So snakes use a variety of habitats um, for a variety of different things. And just because you find a snake in one spot one day, it doesn't mean it's going to be there every day. It doesn't even mean it'll be there, you know, that afternoon. There are seven species of snake in the Okanagan and Similkameen. Um, most of them are actually endangered or threatened, um, mostly due to human persecution and habitat destruction, unfortunately. Um, we do have the one species of rattlesnake, the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, and there are a handful of species around here that can be mistaken for rattlesnakes, even though they are non-venomous. Um, so I'm going to go through the seven species of snake, um, and I'll start with the, the ones that look least like rattlesnakes, and then progress to the ones that, that are most likely to be mistaken for a rattlesnake. So first up is the rubber boa, and you can see how this snake looks more like a worm than anything else. Um, they're very, very shy and very calm snakes, uh, relatively small, um, and they're sort of an all over brownish olive color with paler bellies. Um, they're mostly found in cool, damp places. They are nocturnal, so they're very, very rarely seen. Um, so this um, snake is, is really nothing to be concerned about at all. Um, one of the easiest snakes in the area, I think, to identify um, is the common garter snake. So these snakes are often found in cooler, wetter areas as well, um, and they have a very dark background with uh, quite striking yellow stripes and sometimes red blotches along their sides. Um, these snakes, again, are completely harmless, um, but it is good to note that if you bother one or, or harass one, they can secrete a very, very foul-smelling musk um, that's extremely unpleasant, almost gag-inducing to be around. Um, so it is really best just not to bother them. Um, a cousin to the common garter snake is the terrestrial or wandering garter snake. Uh, contrary to their name, these snakes are actually very good swimmers and love being in the water. Um, they're often not really found too far away from water. Um, at first glance, um, given their sort of darker patchy coloration, they could be mistaken for a small rattlesnake. However, they do have uh, pale creamy yellow stripes, um, similar to the common garter snake, but a little paler. Um, you can see that very distinctively in the left hand photograph. Um, they're usually relatively small and thin as well, um, and obviously won't have a 
So this is a desert night snake. Um, this, this is an incredibly rare snake. Um, it was only actually discovered to exist in British Columbia um, in 1980, so only about 40 years ago. Uh, night, night snakes are very, very small. Um, that is actually a full grown night snake in that middle photo there. Um, just a note on that though, we do not advise handling snakes um, unless you're a professional. Um, this photo was just chosen to show how small a night snake is. Um, so you can see that night snakes have darker blotches along their back like rattlesnakes, um, but they do have a very distinctive mark on their, um, on their neck. It's like a saddle mark. And you can see it really well in the left and middle photos. Um, overall, night snakes tend to be a more bronzy orange color. Uh, they don't have those olivey brown undertones that a rattlesnake will have. Um, that being said, they can tend towards sort of a pale yellowish gray, like in that middle photo. Um, but night snakes are so rare overall um, and just so tiny. Uh, that there, it's just very unlikely that you'd uh, either come across one or really mistake one for a rattlesnake. If you do see a snake that you think might be a night snake, uh, please take a photo if it's safe to do so for you and the snake um, and let us know, let, uh, show us the photo. I mean, it's a big deal if you see a night snake around here. So western yellow-bellied racers are the only other snake in the area really, aside from rubber boas, that are a solid color. Um, they're usually sort of a bluish gray to sort of an olive gray in color, and they have a, a bright yellow belly. Um, they're very long, very thin, extremely fast and agile, hence their name. Uh, most of the time, um, you don't really see much of a racer other than a, a flick of its very thin kind of whip-like tail as it races away from you. Um, but the reason I have them so far down this list as uh, rattlesnakes, um, rattlesnake looking snakes, is because these photos here are of baby Western yellow-bellied racers. Um, so they can uh, look and act convincingly like newborn rattlesnakes. This is a very good defense mechanism when, when uh, confronted by predators, um, but their coloration is a bit off. So their spots are gonna be more orangey colored. Um, the background is gonna be more pale and grayish. Um, they also have very large eyes compared to the size of their head. Uh, if you look in that right hand photo, you can see it's almost cartoonish how large um, the eyes are in, in the head of that baby racer. Um, also, if you look in the left hand photo, uh, you'll notice the bottom half of, of a baby racer, um, unless they're very, very uh, newly born, the bottom half is going to start getting that solid coloration. Um, and you can see at the very bottom that very thin, thin whip-like tail that absolutely does not have anything that might look like a rattle, um, which is a dead giveaway that it is not a rattlesnake. So here we have the Great Basin gopher snake. Um, so gopher snakes are by far the species that is most often confused with rattlesnakes. Um, but this is due in part to their larger size um, and their more similar patterning. Um, but it's also due to their excellent ability to mimic a rattlesnake defensive display. Um, they'll coil up and, into what looks like a striking position um, and they, they will make a really harsh hissing noise and shake their tail in, in leaves or rocks to, to try and mimic that rattle. Um, and while a gopher snake might do its hardest to convince you that it's a rattlesnake, uh, the key difference is in their patterning. So gopher snakes, they have a, a chain-like pattern along the middle of their back, um, sort of these connected squares. Um, along the sides of their body, uh, those scattered markings are a little bit more broken up, um, almost more kind of chaotic than that of a rattlesnake. Um, and like I, I just said, the blotches on their back are, are almost more square than round, um, as opposed to the, the rounder circles of a rattlesnake. Um, and their coloration is go going to be a very, very dark brownish black on tan, um, as opposed to, uh, again, those olivish, olivey brown or even reddish tones of rattlesnake patterns. Um, and then obviously um, they are not, not going to have a rattle, they have that pointed tail. Uh, and gopher snakes also have a dark mask over their eyes. You can see it very well in the right hand. Um, and just a side note, I, lo I know there's a lot of folks from Alberta that like to visit the Okanagan here, and um, you have a very, very similar species in Alberta that you call bull snakes. Um, 
even though the Great Basin Gopher Snake may look very similar to a bull snake, they are actually just quite, quite close cousins. They're both subspecies of the overall gopher snake, uh, snake species. And now we finally arrived at rattlesnakes. So you can see the rattlesnakes do have a fairly distinctive pattern. The blotches on their back uh, are fairly rounded and almost oval shaped, and each blotch is going to have a lighter colored uh, halo or just sort of lighter colored area around it. Uh, rattlesnakes are also going to be more of an olive gray to greenish brown color, sometimes almost reddish. And they're all always going to have a very large triangular shaped head. Uh, rattlesnakes are also quite heavy bodied, more so than any other snake in the area. Uh, this means that they are going to look very wide or very fat for how long they are. Um, and this is in comparison to something like a racer, which is going to be very thin and very slender for its length. And of course, rattlesnakes have rattles, um, but it's important not to rely on seeing a rattle to identify a rattlesnake. Uh, sometimes tails can be hidden, um, or sometimes a rattle can even break off of a rattlesnake. Um, if you look at this smaller middle photo though, you can see why I keep mentioning the pointy tails of all of our other snakes. Um, that middle photo is actually of a baby rattlesnake, which hasn't developed a rattle yet. But you can see how the tip of that tail, its button is what that's called, um, is still very, very rounded and very blunted off. It's not pointy like a, like a racer or a gopher snake. And you can see uh, in that right hand photo, the fully developed rattle on that adult snake on that adult rattlesnake um, is again not super pointy. It's a very, very distinctive structure. Um, and of course that rattle is used um, for defensive display, for, for rattling to let people know that they're there. Um, a lot of people, even locals, uh, have probably never even heard a rattlesnake rattle before though. Um, and this is really a testament to how shy and reclusive rattlesnakes really are. Um, they do truly want to flee if, if you're approaching them. Um, and they're only going to rattle if they're startled or if they're, uh, they're feeling cornered or, or a threat gets too close and then they can't find anywhere to escape. Um, so I can play it here and you'll notice how it almost sounds uh, like a loud buzz at times as well as a rattle. So a huge thanks to Dana uh, for letting me use that video. Um, and please don't try and get a video like this yourself. Uh, Dana is uh, very, very well trained and knows how to do it safely. Um, you may have noticed in the video that a few of those uh, little rattle segments on that rattlesnake are colorful. Um, they're not naturally colored. Uh, researchers like Dana use non-toxic paints to mark uh, the rattles of the rattlesnakes that they're observing. So the, the color of the paint, where on the rattle the paint is located, as well as how many segments get painted at once, um, can all tell the, the researchers different things about each snake. Uh, so now, even though you are familiar with our local snakes, you do still need to know general snake safety, of course. So it's important to always wear uh, pants and boots when hiking, and even gloves uh, if you're gardening. Um, and this is just, you know, on the very, very low off chance that you do get uh, struck at by a snake or even a rattlesnake. Um, they just give you that little bit of protection. Maybe the snake will miss and get the glove or get the boot. Um, it's just a good idea to uh, wear those things. Uh, so it's, it's important to never put your hands or your feet somewhere that you can't see. Um, this is because you don't want to disturb really any snake. You don't want to scare them. Um, you know, if you're reaching over a rock, uh, you, don't, you don't know if there's a rattlesnake maybe on the other side. Um, so when you're hiking or, or around in natural areas, uh, step around, not over large debris. Uh, check on the other side if you can, if it's uh, safe to do so. Um, and get familiar with snake behavior. Uh, early mornings and late evenings are when snakes are going to be most active. Um, so if you are very nervous about encountering a snake, uh, you can reduce your chances of seeing one if you're not out and about at the same time that they are. Um, and in general, uh, just don't harass snakes. Um, not only is it very unkind, 
Um, it's also more likely to make them bite purely out of fear. Um, it is also very illegal. Um, snakes uh, and all wildlife are protected by the Wildlife Act. Um, and so uh, that can come with some pretty heavy fines, actually. So you obviously want to avoid a negative encounter with any snake. Um, snakes will always try to avoid you whenever they can. Uh, but if they get trapped or startled, they're going to feel very exposed, very stressed out. Um, and that's when negative encounters can happen. Um, and it might seem counterintuitive, but ensuring that uh, work or home environments are safe for snakes uh, can help reduce the chance of negative encounters. So if there's um, areas in your yard or maybe at your work that pose a risk to snakes, there is a chance that a snake will get into those places and again, feel exposed and stressed and threatened. So in order to make um, your spaces uh, a little safer for snakes, uh, make, the, make it a little less likely that you might have a negative encounter, um, one of the main things you can do is to avoid rodenticides. Uh, so this isn't actually just for snakes, it kind of goes for all wildlife actually. Uh, so rodents, when they ingest rat poison or, or rodenticide, um, they don't die immediately. Um, it takes them hours and hours. Um, and so in that time, a predator is very likely to eat it because they're going to be a lot slower and they're going to be kind of sick. Um, and so after that, the predator that has eaten it is going to get very, very sick. A lot of the time, especially with birds of prey and owls, um, they will actually die. So if a snake eats a poison rodent, after uh, a very short period of time, it's going to be very sick itself. Um, so it's going to be very stressed, maybe even disoriented. Um, if you come across it, it's just not really going to feel like itself. Um, again, that's going to increase um, the probability of a negative encounter. It's also important, important um, if you use agricultural netting at work um, or if you use small amounts of it even at home um, to keep it very tightly secured on the plants that you're using it on. Um, and when it's being stored to keep it well off the ground. Um, no netting should pool on the ground at any time. Um, and this does actually go for landscape cloth as well. Um, and the reason for this, um, again, this goes for all wildlife, not just snakes, um, is that the fine threads of ag agricultural netting and those small holes make it very, very easy for animals and snakes to get tangled up. Um, and once they get tangled, they, you know, start to panic, they get very, very stressed. Um, and if you have to come and untangle a wild animal from the netting, it's going to be a very negative experience for, for you and for them. Uh, so by keeping it tightly secured and keeping it off the ground, um, when not in use or um, when it's being stored or even just extra netting at the end of a row um, is going to just be better for everyone involved. Um, and so you also um, can maybe consider creating uh, refugia or hiding places for snakes specifically um, in more low traffic areas. So this seems a little bit counterintuitive but if you give them spaces away from high traffic areas in your yard or, or at work, um, it gives them somewhere to go so they don't have to encounter you if they don't want to. Um, this can be uh, used in conjunction with sort of securing areas that might attract snakes. Um, you can you know, close in an open set of stairs. Um, you can make sure that there aren't large piles of rocks um, around in, in a high traffic area. Um, again, just trying to minimize encounters between humans and snakes. Um, and you can also install signage just to raise awareness. So if people are aware of where they might find snakes or even just aware that there are snakes in the area, um, it becomes less of a shock or a surprise if they maybe see one. And again, that can reduce conflict and negative encounters. So you can follow all these snake safety tips, um, but there are snakes that live here. So there, always a there is always a chance that you might come across a snake anyway, and, and that's fine. They're just as scared of you as you might be of them. Um, so you just need to uh, not panic. Um, if you are afraid of snakes, it is very important to try and keep yourself calm. Um, panic can sometimes cloud judgment. Um, and a lack of judgment can hurt you, it can hurt the snake, or it can hurt both of you, and uh, no one wants that to happen. So once you've realized there's a snake somewhere near you, you just take a deep breath, take a large, calm step backwards, and use your new ID skills to evaluate um, what kind of snake do you think it is, what, what are their markings like. 
Um, if it is very obviously a non-venomous snake, maybe it's a garter snake or a rubber boa, um, you can give it space. You can calmly, you know, move around it, continue on your way, and that's fine. Um, but it's very, very important that, uh, that an unidentified snake or a snake um, for which you're not sure what species it is should always be assumed to be a rattlesnake, just to be on the safe side. So if you're not sure what kind of snake it is, or if you are certain that it is a rattlesnake, there are some additional steps. So if the rattlesnake is rattling at you, then you are too close, um, but it is important to note that they are rattling, like I said earlier, um, just because uh, uh, they want to notify you that they're there. It's not an attack call. They're not going to rattle as they bite you. Um, it's rattling out of fear and out of courtesy. Um, they're basically, basically saying, if you get out of the way, neither of us will get hurt. So if you are in striking distance of a rattling rattlesnake, uh, they can strike about two thirds of their body length. So here in BC, where our rattlesnakes almost never get longer than four feet, that distance will be about three feet or one meter away. So if you're within that one meter distance of a rattling snake, it is important to remain very still because that rattlesnake is very scared at the moment. Um, it's important to have someone else, um, you know, pick up a large object like a stick um, to distract the rattlesnake um, because you are in snake country. I hope you're not hiking alone. Um, so you distract the snake with a stick, maybe wave it around in the opposite direction from where you are. And once the snake has turned its attention to this new distraction, take a large, slow step away from it and out of strike range. Once you are out of strike range, or if you were always out of strike range, you can just slowly, calmly move yourself and others um, even further away from the snake. Um, it's eventually going to move on once you're far enough away. Like I said, they're very shy and timid. They're not aggressive. They're not going to chase you. Um, once they, they sense that you've you know, moved far enough away, they're probably going to move on um, and leave the area. So things are a bit different if you do see a rattlesnake in a high traffic area. Um, so that's maybe a park or somewhere at work or somewhere in your garden at home. Uh, so you need to follow the previous steps just to make sure that no one um, is around the rattlesnake. But you do need to stay in the very general area and keep an eye on where the rattlesnake is, just so, just so you know, and so you can alert others to avoid that area as well. So you can call a conservation officer or sometimes even a bylaw officer um, just because they are often trained in how to move these snakes. Uh, it's important not to move it yourself because there is a very specific technique that is used to keep you safe and to keep the snake safe as well. Uh, if you're at work there, there may be a trained person on staff uh, and there should probably be work protocols for rattlesnake encounters as well. Um, and if on the very, very slim chance that, you know, someone does happen to surprise a rattlesnake and does get bitten, um, again, it's important to keep calm. Um, again, if you're at work, there should be very um, distinctive procedures for this. Um, you should probably call a manager or a crew leader. Um, and if you're with someone that has um, had a snake bite, um, you need to remove all constricting items. Um, so. Uh, you know, rings, watches, um, tight socks, bracelets, shoes, um, and this is to make sure that the venom can flow freely, and that seems very backwards, um, but the northern Pacific rattlesnake, the snake, the rattlesnake that we have here, um, is, has a little bit of a less potent venom than a lot of other venomous snakes, so um, you want to let it uh, dilute through the body, essentially. Um, and while you're taking the person to the hospital or while someone is taking you to the hospital, um, you need to call the hospital ahead and just inform them that a rattlesnake bite will be arriving. It allows them to, to prepare the antivenom, prepare any procedures that they might have for a rattlesnake bite. And there are a few things that it is very important not to do. Um, you do not, under any circumstances, kill the snake. Like I said earlier, that is extremely illegal. Um, and not necessary because if you're bitten by a rattlesnake, you just know what to do anyway. Um, and it's important that you don't touch the bite area in any way. Um, nearly all the old methods, all those methods you used to see in a movie, like sucking venom or cutting around the bite, are going to just create a lot more harm to the bite area. 
Um, you do not need to use a tourniquet um, for our snakes. Like I said, the venom is not as potent as a lot of other venomous snakes. Um, in some other areas of the world, a tourniquet may be recommended if the venom is a substantially more potent. Um, but here in BC, all that is going to do is create a lot more damage to the bite area. And it's always helpful to remember uh, that a bite from our rattlesnake, the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, is almost never fatal. Um, in the last 90 or so years, there's only been a single death from a rattlesnake bite. Um, and even though there are a couple of bites that do happen every year, there's almost never any long-term effects in the, the snake bite victim. So now that you know your snakes and you know snake safety and how to react around snakes, we're gonna see uh, how you do with telling them apart. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few seconds here. You can try and figure out which snake species is in each photo. There may be doubles, maybe there's not. Um, if you do really wanna go back and try and figure it out, um, you can pause the video and go back and forth to the ID section. Um, so I'll just give you a few more seconds here. All right, just another second. All right, so let's see how you did. So numbers three and five are gopher snakes. So you can see on both snakes, um, it is a, a fairly broken up pattern. Uh, the blotches on the back are a little more squared off. The pattern's more chaotic. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly dark uh, pattern on quite a light tan background. Um, you can also see the, the thinner head and then in photo five, that very distinctive black mask as well. So then photos two and four are the rattlesnakes. Um, you can see, especially in photo number four, how clear those blotches are and how they almost look a little bit oval um, with those light halos around them. You can see that triangular head. You can see, especially in photo two, how really thick and heavy body they look. Um, and in photo four, I did crop it off, but you could see the rattle as well. So that leaves photo one and photo six, and they are a baby uh, yellow-bellied racer and a terrestrial garter snake respectively. So you can notice um, the orangey blotches on a light background in the yellow-bellied racer. Um, that snake is also very, very tiny as well with very large cartoonish eyes and of course no rattle and that whip-like tail if, it, if I hadn't cropped it off. Um, on the garter snake, you can see those cream-colored lines and stripes along its back as well as uh, the darker blotches along it are quite small and almost polka dotty. And of course, it's going to be very thin and have a very small pointy tail. So if you're still unsure of your snake ID, maybe you got a couple wrong and it makes you, you know, a little nervous that maybe you won't be able to tell in the wild, um, that's okay. It can take a while to get comfortable with identifying snakes. Um, so you can do your own research. You can look up pictures of our snakes online get used to seeing them, what the different snakes look like, um, and you can observe those small differences maybe in their, in their colors or their patterns. Um, there are some good websites here that you can use um, to, to look for those different photos. Um, and there's also just another uh, few resources just on snakes in general. So you can go to our website, www.osstewardship.ca. Um, Wild Safe BC also has some great resources on just wildlife conflict reduction in general. Um, the Okanagan Snoqualmie Conservation Alliance has some information on relocating rattlesnakes. Um, and then the BC Reptiles website, bcreptiles.ca, um, has some photo galleries as well as just some, just some general information about our local snakes. Uh, so thank you very much for listening um, and also thank you very much to our funders for making this project possible.